Peace be upon you. God willing, today we're going to read from uh, Appendix 27 from the translation of the Quran by Dr. Rashad Khalifa. Uh, and the title of this appendix is, uh, Who is Your God? And uh, God willing, we're going to uh, read through it and then look at the verses and uh, go a little deeper into it. So it starts off by saying, most people are outraged upon hearing this question. What do you mean, who is your God? They ask. My God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And most of these people will be shocked to find out that their proclamation that their God is the creator of the heavens and the earth is no more than lip service, and that they are in fact destined for hell. So we see in chapter 12, verse 1 of 6, it reads, we seek refuge in God from saying the rejected. It reads, the majority of those who believe in God do not do so without committing idol worship. And uh, in 39, 38, we see a number of these examples where uh, it says, if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say, God, say, why then do you set up idols beside God? Uh, so you see in this example, it's clear that, you know, these people claim to believe in God, yet they're setting up idols beside God. And in 23, 84 through 89, it reads, say, to whom belongs the heaven and the earth? <clears throat> oh, apologies. It says, to whom belongs the earth and everyone on it, if you know? Uh, they will say to God, say, why then do you not take heed? Say, who is the Lord of the seven universes, the Lord of the great dominion? They will say, God, say, why then do you not turn righteous? Say, in whose hand is all sovereignty over all things? And he's the only one who can provide help, but needs no help. If you know, they will say, God, say, where did you go wrong? So again, you're seeing, you know, to claim to believe in God really doesn't mean much without taking the proper action. Uh, for instance, a uh, great example of this is Satan, right? Satan clearly believes in God. Uh, Satan knows God's, uh, uh, who God is. Uh, but obviously doesn't understand uh, God's uh, authority and power, but nevertheless, he believes, he knows God's existence. So strictly just knowing that uh, God exists is uh, fundamentally different than believing in God's word and his attributes. And uh, one of the other verses that uh, touch on this point is in chapter 43, verse 6 through 9. It reads, we have sent many a prophet to the previous generations. Every time a prophet went to them, they ridiculed him. Consequently, we annihilated people who were even more powerful than these. We thus set the examples from the previous communities. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say the Almighty, the Omniscient has created them. So these are people who claim that when you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, you know, they use the attributes of the Almighty, the Omniscient. Uh, yet, you know, they were disbelievers. Um, they didn't believe in God's true attributes. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, live by the uh, the commandments that God gave. And alternately, alternatively, um, or ultimately, uh, they they suffered the consequences about that. And um, you know, just shows that it was just uh, lip service. So, how do we know if we're actually worshiping God alone? Um, what's a kind of a a factor that we can we can test, and uh, the messenger of the covenant gives us this uh, this simple simple rule. It says, "Your God is whoever or whatever occupies your mind most of the time." That's it, right? Whatever we spend the majority of our time thinking about, you know, planning around, that is our God. You know, if we spent the majority of our time thinking about, you know, our spouses, our loved ones, uh, our business, you know, sometimes it's not even good stuff, right? Maybe it's something that we worry about. Um, when we start planning around that as that being the fundamental cornerstone of our lives, uh, that ultimately ends up being our God. So we need to make a priority to make you know God our God. Um, and there's numerous examples of you know different forms of gods that people have in their life. And obviously these, this is a God with a lowercase g because uh, there's only one uh, God with a capital G. But, you know, in 7190, we read the example of uh, people who use their uh, children as a, an idol, as their God. It says, but when we, he gives them a good baby, they turn his gift into an idol that rivals him. God be exalted far above any partnership. Um, in 924, we see a number of examples of people who put, you know, a, uh, a God above uh, uh, the true God. It says, proclaim, if your parents, your children... Your siblings, your spouses, your family, the money you have earned, a business you worry about, or the homes and the homes you cherish are more beloved to you than God and his messenger and the striving in his cause. Then just wait until God brings his judgment. God does not guide the wicked people. And, um, you know, it, it specifies here 
you know, the business you worry about, right? It's not even, <laughs> some people think that, you know, their God is something that they, uh, they worship, uh, you know, happily. But here in this case, you see that it's, it could be something that you worry about. If it occupies your mind more than God does, then, um, you know, it's probably time to, uh, to reflect and reform. And in uh, 1835, we read the example of the two men uh, who basically were setting up, one of them was setting up uh, their business uh, as, a, as a god. And the header reads, property is an idol. Uh, it reads, cite for them the example of two men. We gave one of them two gardens of grapes surrounded by date palms and placed other crops between them. Both gardens produced their crops on time and generously, for we caused the river to run through them. Once after harvesting, he boastfully told his friend, I am far more prosperous than you, and I command more respect from the people. When he entered a gar his garden, he wronged his soul by saying, I do not think that this will ever end. Moreover, I think it is it. it this is it. I do not think the hour to hereafter will ever come to pass. Even if I am returned to my Lord, I'll be clever enough to possess an even better one over there. So this is a person who's, you know, thinks that his happiness, his joy, comes from uh, this garden God, that God has given him. And, uh, you know, it's clearly setting up a, a God beside God. And uh, this example is actually one probably uh, warrants a podcast in itself, but, you know, we'll continue on. And um, one of the final uh, gods that people have as a God beside God is, uh, you know, their own egos. And uh, this one, it's uh, uh, many, many verses that talks about an ego as a God. And again, you know, each one of these can probably be a, uh, podcast in itself. So in 2543, it reads, The ego is a god. Have you seen the one whose god is his own ego? Will you be his advocate? So this is why we note that one of the most important and most repeated commandments in the Quran is, uh, in 3341, it reads, Oh, you believe you shall remember God frequently, glorify him day and night. Right? We need to make God our number one priority. Uh, everything we do, you know, uh, the love that we have for our uh, spouses, our children, it's all for the sake of God. And by, you know, loving God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, uh, it actually increases uh, our love that we can have for others. And um, we have to understand that, you know, God is everything good that comes to us, every blessing we have, uh, this chance in this world, it rests alone 100% on God, and we can never, never lose sight of that. And in 3191, it says, They remember God while standing, sitting, and on their sides, and they reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord, you do not create all this in vain. Be you glorified. Save us from the retribution of hell. So I had a, you know, someone asked me once, they said, how do you remember God all the time? I mean, you know, you watch TV, you uh, work, you do all these stuff. And um, God gives us, you know, gives us ways to make sure that God is our priority. That even though we are fully functional members of society, uh, we have families, we have work, we have obligations, that throughout all this, you know, God is still our cornerstone. God is still the foundation of, uh, of everything in our lives. And um, one of the, uh, uh, the blessings is that God has given us steps, you know, that if we apply these, we can ensure that, you know, God will be our God and God will be on our mind the majority of the day. Um, and the messenger has uh, spelt these out into... Uh, five categories and God willing let's uh let's see what it says it says to put this commandment into practice we must establish certain habits whereby we guarantee that God occupies our minds more than anything else the Quran helps us establish such uh, soul-saving habits so the first one is the contact prayer salat so those who observe the five daily prayers come a long way towards commemorating God a significant portion of their waking hours salat helps us remember God not only during the few minutes of prayer but also throughout the times of anticipation. Uh, at 11 a.m., one may look at his, his or her watch to see if the moon, uh, noon prayer is due yet. This act causes one to think about God, and one is credited accordingly. And in 20 verse 14, we read, I am God, there is no other God beside me, you shall worship me alone, and observe the contact purse a lot to remember me. So this is God actually speaking to Moses. And it says that, you know, the purpose of the contact prayers is so we remember God. And you think about this, you know, five prayers spread out throughout, you know, the day and the night. And uh, each one gives us a chance to remember God. And I like to think of my contact prayers as kind of a, um, a baseline where 
if I can spend those few minutes, you know, focused and thinking and reflecting about God and the, the blessings and, you know, the words that I'm saying uh, during the contact prayer, then it's probably a good indicator that, you know, God is on my mind. But if during those times, those, you know, few minutes, they really are, it's only a few minutes that we spend doing each of our contact prayers. If I'm thinking about something else, you know, I'm thinking about work, I'm thinking about a presentation, I'm thinking about, you know, school, maybe I have a test or something of that nature, or, you know, what I'm going to eat for dinner or something, you know, trivial, like, oh, I need to, to fold the clothes after I'm done or something like that. It's probably an indicator that, you know, I need to be more focused. I need to reflect more on God. And, um, you know, it's, it serves as such an amazing, simple, uh, just way to, to recalibrate ourselves, to make sure that God is our priority. And, um, you know, to take a step out from your day to day, to just reflect, you know, to, to think about God, uh, clear out your other thoughts and just, just focus on God. The second item the messenger spells out is the uh, commemorate God before eating. And this is in uh, verse uh, 6, 121. Uh, that God enjoins that we mention his name before we eat. It says, you shall not eat from that upon which God's name has not been mentioned. Now you think of this, you know, every uh, piece of food you eat, every uh, glass of water you have, um, you take a second before you, you let that, that food touch your mouth to, to reflect upon God, to thank God, um, to be appreciative, you know, mention God's name. Uh, that he created that food for you, you know, the, the taste buds in your mouth um, that, that combine with, you know, the molecules that give you the, the sweet, sour, the umami, uh, bitter, what else is there? Sweet, sour, umami, bitter. There's one other, uh, oh, salty, <laughs> you know, these flavors. And, you know, apparently there's, uh, there's more flavors out there in the combination of all this um, that we're experiencing, experiencing in the nutrients and the uh, nutri nutrition that we get in our bodies. Uh, that God created all this, you know, uh, we had the previous podcast thinking about how the food uh, got from, you know, uh, the soil all the way to your plate, you know, and it's something to always be uh, appreciative for, something to, to reflect and, you know, just take that extra second that before you allow that food, you know, to basically uh, touch your mouth before you consume it to, to think about God, to commemorate God and to uh, mention his name. The third item, it says, God willing, inshallah. So you shall not say, I will do this or that tomorrow without saying, God willing, inshallah. If you forget to do this, then apologize and say, my Lord, uh, may my Lord guide me to do better next time. And this is uh, chapter 18, verse 24. It says, this is the direct commandment that we must carry out no matter who we are talking with. So this is something that, you know, obviously sometimes it might get awkward uh, that when you're talking with someone and you say you're going to do something in the future, uh, to say God willing to invoke God's name. I mean, at this day, uh, in day and age, in most you know, in the most place in the world, when you mention God in a business setting, uh, you know, you get ridiculed, you get mocked, uh, you get, uh, um, in essence, looked down upon. Uh, but we have to understand, you know, we're doing this not only to reflect, but also to set an example, because uh, it's true. It's uh, if you don't invoke God when you say you're going to do something in the future, you're saying that you have the capability of carrying out such and such event when you don't realize that God is the one who allows it to take place if he so wills. And even if you get to the point of, uh, you know, if you ever execute a contract, uh, a lot of times they have a, a clause in there where they say acts of God, right? So they realize in a legal setting that this is a very um, uh, concise um, uh, statement that you realize that anything we're going to do anything in the future that if god does not will it it's not going to happen so that's why we invoke you know the creator's name that when anytime we say we're going to do anything in the future that we actually say god willing and um, this is actually also specified in the bible in the chapter james um pull it up here uh so it's in the book of James, chapter 4, uh, starting from verse 13. It says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to, uh, to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why do you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are in a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if this is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. 
As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows uh, the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. So that was number three. And then number four, it says, uh, mashallah, God's gift. It says to invoke God's protection for our beloved objects, our children, our cars, our homes, etc. We're enjoined in 1839 to say, uh, mashallah. This is God's gift. And uh, the verse reads, important commandment, when you entered your garden, you, you should have said, this is what God has given me, mashallah. No one possesses power except God. So again, you know, when someone gives us a compliment or we're appreciative for something we have, uh, we acknowledge God. We say mashallah. We say God's gift. We say thank you, God. Um, again, it's uh, understanding that God is the one who gives us that happiness. And uh, the fifth one, it says, glorify God day and night. When we eat anything, we shouldn't be like animals. We must reflect on God's creation of the food we are eating, the flavor, our enjoyment due to the senses God has given us, the perfect packaging of the banana or the orange, the varieties of the seafoods created by God, etc. And glorify Him as we enjoy His provisions. When we see a beautiful flower or animal or sunset, we must glorify God. We must seize every possible opportunity to remember and glorify God so that God may be our God. And the uh, the sixth one, the last, uh, uh, obviously, I mean, there's so many other ways uh, that we can remember God, make God a priority, but these are things that we can apply to our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it says, the first utterance, make it a habit to say in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, there's no other God besides God. The moment you wake up every morning, if you establish this uh, good habit, this is what you will utter when you're resurrected. And uh, in 5248 reads, you shall steadfastly persevere in carrying out your Lord's command. You are in our eyes and glorify and praise your Lord when you get up. So you think of this, uh, God says in the Quran that, you know, uh, death and life is like basically each time we uh, wake and sleep, uh, God is putting us to death and he resurrects us in the other uh, morning. And, um, you know, it's something to be appreciative for. And when you think about every verse in the Quran, with the exception of chapter 9, it starts with this statement, uh, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. And when we make that the statement, when we get up in the morning, that we make a conscious effort uh, to say these words, to reflect upon God, you know, there isn't a better way that we can start uh, our days. You know, some people think uh, they get up in the morning and they, they look at the alarm clock and they freak out and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> this isn't the way, you know, uh, a submitter should start their day. A submitter starts the day, this moment their eyes wake up, that they're, uh, they're conscious of uh, uh, their state of sleep, that, um, that they uh, reflect upon God and they say these words. And, um, you know, these are such small, small little things that we can do uh, that God tells us, you know, that we, we should do uh, if we want to make God our God. And um, if we do this, we're really setting ourselves on the right path uh, to be successful, uh, both in this life and in the hereafter. And it reminds me of, uh, uh, there was a uh, policy that uh, New York implemented uh, to reduce, uh, you know, violence and uh, crime uh, in New York City. And they said the, the no broken window policy. Now, there's been a lot of debate if this has actually been the root cause for the decline in crime, but it's a... Uh, uh, similar kind of a parable, you know, the the idea was that, you know, oh, they needed to be tougher on crime, so they need to be, spend more resources to find the drug dealers, the, the gangbangers, the murderers, the rapists, and all this stuff, and what the police commissioner decided to do instead, he said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to crack down on no broken windows, because the second someone sees a broken window, they think that they're in the ghetto, and they're going to basically uh, think that this is a place where there is no authority, and they can get away with stuff. So he started with that, and then he moved on to no graffiti and no uh, jumping uh, the toll for the subway. And by cracking down on you know these very kind of simple tasks, uh, it established a precedent in New York City that the cops were really cracking down, you know. And because they were being so harsh on these you know these uh, relatively small stuff, people's assumption was that they couldn't get away with the big stuff, and. You know, it's it's interesting. Sometimes we just implement these tiny little day-to-day uh, -day habits. And the outcomes of those habits end up being tremendous. You know, you think of this, uh, you know, you get up five times a day. 
and you start getting up at dawn. And at the beginning, it's tough. But eventually, you, you build up the discipline where you enjoy getting up. And you think of how much productivity you have in your day, right, by being able to get up early. Uh, obviously, you know, sometimes you might decide to go, to go back to bed. But if you do decide to, you know, uh, take advantage of being up, um, you have this huge kind of gain over your peers. Uh, and you think about that, that you partition your day into five times where, you know, people, it's like they're doing God knows what, watching TV, playing video games, you know, uh, not to say that there isn't a time for that, but they, they completely lose track of time. And, you know, before they know it, it's, you know, the sun's down and they've lost their day. But by having that opportunity to take a few minutes out of your day to go and perform the contact prayers, each time you're recalibrating your priorities to make sure that God is your priority. Now, I wanted to get back to the uh, that question at hand that some people said, you know, well, what do I do? Do I just, you know, spend all my time thinking about God and I'm not able to function throughout the day because God has to be my priority? And the answer is, when you implement these, right, you realize that while you're working, while you're with your family, while you're you're out running errands, you're doing God knows what, you're watching a, a movie, you know, anytime you see something that, that is... Uh, uh, that is awe-inspiring, you know, you thank God. Uh, anytime you see something that, you know, you're, you're at the parking lot and you're trying to find a parking spot, you invoke God. And you start doing this throughout your entire day where everything you do, you're thinking about God, you know, and it completely blends into your life uh, to the point where it's not this segregated activity to think about God, to remember God, that it becomes one. And, um, you know, there's the expression, I think we talked about it before, is the neurons that uh, fire together, wire together, to the point that you start associating everything with God, you know. Uh, you, you turn on the faucet, and you see the water come out, and it's, you know, perfectly uh, clean, clear, uh, clear, safe to drink, and, and you're able to use it to, you know, wash your hands, you know, yet alone uh, to drink, and you're just absolutely appreciative. Um, in every aspect, right, you step out and you take that nice... Uh, breath of fresh air you know some places in the world the pollution is so bad that they don't have that luxury uh you know but most places do and you, you just you you take that moment and you reflect about god and you think about god and you're appreciative and um it's not something you know some people think that uh religion advocates a form of hermitism and this is actually condemned in the Quran. You know, God wants us to be active. God wants us to be out in society uh, to basically, you know, to, to strive uh, because we're trying to please God. Uh, we want God to be pleased with us, with our actions and our day to day. Um, and you think about when you start doing these things, God rewards us, you know, manifold, not only in the hereafter, but in this life, just by simply having this, this, uh, this level of consciousness of our thoughts, of our actions, um, allows us to be able to do great things. It's, it's the great discipline that we need to be successful in life. And um, there's so much more that can be said about this, and God willing, we'll continue on into uh, future podcasts. But uh, we'll stop it there. This one ran a little longer than normal, but uh, inshallah, um, gives us a chance to reflect and be appreciative. Uh, as always, you got questions, uh, got comments, uh, feel free to let us know at Talk at gmail.com. Uh, until next time, peace and God bless.